Today I'm going to talk about some new things, some old things, and some old things that are new things to me. Hey everybody, it's me Margaret and I have made a big mess in my craft room, but I am still a Mississippi native transplanted to Atlanta, Georgia, where I sheepishly share things I love with you, but I'm going to spare you this clutter for just a minute. So today we're going to begin with something called the Traveling Yarn Box. This was something that um, Aaron Give Me Yarn 418 had organized, although you may have seen them going around other places as well. It's not the, a brand new concept, but it is a clever concept. And the way it works is that the person who starts it gets one of those postage paid boxes. No, 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 no. Not a postage paid box, but a flat rate priority mail box. And loads it with a bunch of items. And then they trap they send it off to the next person who can then take whatever they want from the box as long as they replace it with comparable items, uh, you know, monetarily or whatever. And it continues on to the next person. And so it's really fun to open it up and just to go through everything that's there. And I would love to have done that for you on camera, but that takes the fun out of it. You can't do that. Because then if someone who watches your videos happens to see everything that's in there, then, then it takes a surprise out for them, it takes a surprise away. So, what I can show you is what I took from the box. Now, there was yarn in the box, lots of different uh, unique items, uh, all yarn, re yarn related. But I was drawn to things that I had either never seen or that I don't have access to on a regular basis. Like these, I think it's, it's, it's Tunisian crochet hooks. It says crochet swivel hooks. It's in a size K, which is 6.5 millimeter, and it's double-ended hooks on a cord, like so. And it swivels, these twists like this. So I'm pretty sure that this is just basically an Afghan hook, a Tunisian crochet hook, and it's something that I've really wanted to learn to do for a long time. Clarification, I've dabbled in it, but I've never made a whole full project. So I am going to, I don't know when I'm going to do that, <laughs> but for some reason I felt the need to to have these. And I like the little case. Look, it fits in a notebook, which is, happens to be where I keep my knitting needles, so I could put this in there too. So if you put this in there, thank you very much. Then another thing I took from there is this little, it looks like a tiny, tiny crochet hook. It's got a knitting needle type end over here, and then it's a little crochet hook, and that's for fixing drop stitches and knitting. So that's a handy thing. Now I have seen these things with two crochet hooks on either side, which is really good for garter stitch repair, but that's not what this is, but it didn't matter. I thought I had to have it, so I took it. And then this is something else that I love. I love history. I love everything about history, and I watch old movies, and I listen to old radio shows, and, and I, I read books, factual-based books, nonfiction, and then I read um, historical fiction books set in a period of time that I might be learning about at that time, so I think that's really fun. But in there, in the box, were these old crochet pattern books. I don't know if you saw a video a while back, but May had sent me a bunch of books that I just cherish. I love them. I love to go through them. I may never m make a single project in here, but I have the best time just laying in bed and looking through these things. Not only are the patterns fun to look at, but the advertisements in the book are fun to look at. It says, The Work Basket, Home and Needle Craft for Pleasure and Profit. It's dated March 1948, shortly after the end of the Second World War. And then here we've got one from 1953, one from 1955, also called The Work Basket, but they, they upgraded their logo from this one right here. Here's a five room house for a grand total of $1,985 that one could buy. 
Yeah, I think I get just as much pleasure out of reading some of these um, advertisements as than I do the actual the actual patterns. But also in here we have cooking with herbs and it tells us all about the different types of herbs and what you might want to cook with them. It has some recipes in here. Man, I could be a terrific homemaker. Now there were different types of yarn in that box. Now I'm editing myself out here because stupidly I started describing yarn, but that might ruin the surprise for somebody else, so I had to shut myself up. And I had pulled them all out and that's what I was going to keep. But as I got to thinking about it, I decided I didn't want to do that. And so I put them all back in. And what I did take out was the worsted. <laughs> And I told you that I wasn't going to buy any more acrylic yarn. And here was a chance for me to have something that I've never had before. The tweeds, the Lion Brand tweed stripes, uh, without buying it. <laughs> and I can make a great little charity hat out of these happy colors. So I was really, I was fine with that. I actually, I wasn't going to take any yarn at all, but that box was so packed jam full of stuff that I couldn't put my contribution in there without having to take out some yarn. <laughs> so I settled on a, um, an old friend, which was a Lion Bread acrylic, although it was new to me. I'd never done the tweed stripes. And I can't tell you what I put in there because that would be ruining the surprise. So, oh well. So what have I been working on in my cute little bag? this linen shawl. I am getting really close to being finished with this linen shawl. Remember to check the description box for yarn and pattern information. But I will tell you, as I do with large projects, I get bored with them. So I have to put them down and work on something else. And I believe that I told you last week that I was working on these socks and I have made some progress on these little socks but I made the same mistake that I did last time and started doing the patterning on the back and instead of ripping it out I left that one row of patterning right there I'm hoping it's going to teach me a lesson the th reason why we don't generally put patterning on the sole of our feet is because we could maybe feel it and that might be uncomfortable or distracting or something like that. So if it does bother me, then that will be a lesson to me not to do this again. <laughs> but to be honest with you, where it hits, I don't think it's going to be a problem. So, um, but then again, you know me, I'm not a perfectionist, so I won't have a problem leaving that there. Now, because I just love knitting for charity, I had to do a hat. I put the socks down, I put the shawl down. I'm generally one of these people who really likes to complete a project. I don't have more than one or two on the needles or, or crochet hook at the same time, but I needed to. I needed to stop and do a hat. So I pulled out some of this. It's Red Heart Soft. It was given to me by Erin last time I was in Vermont. She had been cleaning out and getting rid of her stuff uh, that she wasn't going to use, that she didn't think she would use. And she had three of these coral skeins. That's the color is coral. And I just loved this color. And I had been working on these cool colors. And this coral just really caught my eye when I was in there. So I said, you know what? I'm going to knit a hat. It's been a while since I knit a basic hat. So that good old pattern, the boyfriend beanie, I think it's called. Oh, no, no, no. It's the regular guy beanie. Free pattern on Ravelry. I will link it below. It's a basic worsted weight beanie. And that's what I'm working on here. However, I have bad news to report. My Cubics needle, and this is the rosewood or the wood, whatever kind of wood it is. I'm using 4.5 because that's what I need to use on worsted weight. That works best for me at the gauge. Needle just broke. It just totally broke right off of this thing. Now, I stepped on one of these needles not too long ago and broke it, but I was just knitting, minding my own business and doing the decreases and it just broke boom so that was disappointing and 
strangely enough these were 4.5s in my uh, short tips the little short ones strangely enough in my set that I have in the long tips one of these, it's not broken per se, but it won't screw into the cord. It's, it's like it just keeps turning and turning and turning and won't actually tighten. So that's annoying that my 4.5 cubics in both sets are not working. So these are Knitter's Pride. I love my nickel plated sets and have never had any trouble with them, knock on wood. But for whatever reason, my 4.5s are jinxed. We've got something exciting. I have a box here that has come to me from the Steady Hand, which is an Etsy store. And this Etsy store happens to be featured in one of the upcoming knit crates. I think it's this month. And she sent me, April Maisie is her name, isn't that cute? And she sent me a box of goodies from her store that we can use for a giveaway to you after we see what's in it. There's an envelope. And inside is, it's, it's like, a, like a big card. It's on um, brown paper with a precious stamp. I mean, detail-oriented. I'm going to read this. There's a letter in here for me, and I'm going to read this, and then I'll turn the camera back on. Okay, in this letter, she included uh, a list of everything that she put in this box, which was incredibly generous, and all her contact information and everything, and she also shared with me a story of how she came to make one of her most unique items. Now, in the steady hand, one of the things you're going to see a lot of that she makes are different types of bags, different types of project bags at the steady hand, and some needle holders. is this the little bag like that oh my word how cute is that has a little tag over here professionally printed tag these are super gift items guys look how cute care instructions we can actually wash these of course naturally I'm thinking as I look at these, I'm thinking project bags, sock bags, cute little bags for small projects like this. But I've been sewing a lot lately. I can actually see this hanging beside my sewing machine when I either put keep notions for handy reach or for my threads that I clip because basically what I do right now is throw them on the floor and then I have to remember to go back and clean them up. But how cute and decorative are these? Now's a good time to stop right here and pop over to April's store, The Steady Hand on Etsy. I'm going to put a link in the description box so you don't have to remember that. And I want to point out that those little bags, she calls them small yarn bags. She also has them in medium and large bags as well. But you can see right now her store is very full, 139 items. She's got a sale going on. I'm really impressed. All right, let's see what else she's got. Oh, and then here's a little, another kitty one with the tiny little Notion bag. And, oh, how cute is this? Can you see what this is? It's like a progress marker that she's attached to the end. I mean, we could use this. We could literally take it off and use it as a progress marker. But it's also decorative. And then you unzip it and you can put all your little notions in this tiny little... Oh, how cute is this? Very nice. And guys, the quality is good. Now, you know, I've been sewing on these skirts and I am admittedly not a real professional seamstress. Sewist, we say nowadays, because we don't like to say sewer because that's spelled like sewer. And that's not a good image to think about. But I know good stuff when I see it. 
I just can't replicate it. And this is pretty nice. Good job, April. So we pop them back over to her store and you can see that what she sent us was a mini. This is called a mini pouch. And then she's also got small zipper pouches and large zipper pouches. And then, okay, here's one of her needle cases. Now, this is a double pointed needle case. I'm sorry, I keep having to interrupt myself, but I want to point out that she's got two different sizes here, and she refers to them as DPN holders, double-pointed needle cases. However, notice that she has included pictures of circular needles as well. There is no reason why these little cases couldn't hold circular needles too. So, I'll just call it a needle case. Snaps open, it's plastic snaps and you put them in like that and then close them up. And now they're not going to fall out or poke anything. They're safely contained in there. Cute, cute, and it's constellations. Did I say that? They're constellations uh, in this print and that matches. Isn't that cute? All right, now this is one of her unique designs, I think. Let me, let me check to make sure. It zips all around like this. Yeah, this is it. Now, I have not seen these before. But what, well, let me read to you what she says. Came from one of her longtime customers. She messaged her and asked her to make something that she could use to store all her progress keepers and stitch markers. And she had quite the collection. And I guess all of us do. Don't we kind of get obsessed with collecting those things? She wanted something that would close so nothing would accidentally fall out. And with that in mind, I drew up some designs. I made one of each for her to, to, send, to send her and try out. Her favorite was the zip around. And using her feedback, she made some design changes until we both came to an agreement that it was pretty much perfect. So you can see that you put your progress keepers and stitch markers that open you can put on here I can't see where any of these would be any way with that you would open it to put your solid circle stitch markers around but and anybody who knows me knows that I believe this everything is figure outable <laughs> so with that in mind let's look at them in action okay on this side I clipped some progress keepers to the little things and you can see they're not going anywhere right but what about those um, circular stitch markers that you have that you can't take apart to put on this little thing these do not come apart as good they shouldn't because then they might come apart and then when you open your zip pouch everything would fall down that would not be good so what I did was this. I keep my stitch markers on a little piece of yarn anyway, but look, if you merely run it through the loop, this is a simple fix. Now, these are the rest of the, of the progress keepers that I was demonstrating with here, but I keep them on a piece of yarn normally before I had something cool like this. And so what I did was just ran the yarn through the loop and that stays put. You close it up, you zip it up, and everything's neat. So this is kind of a one-stop shop for all your stitch markers, no matter what kind they are, all your progress keepers. And then zip it up. I love the way though that it zips all the way around because when you're choosing, and you know good and well, you like to choose your different types. What do I want to use today when you're using your stitch markers? You open it up and it's almost like a book. Like, you know, kind of like, oh, now you can see everything you've got to choose from. Really cute idea. Great job, April, and super well made. I love her little tags that she's got. Very, very good attention to detail. I love that. What else is in this box. She included some wrapping paper so that when I send somebody a winning prize from the giveaway, I can present it as nicely as she would. Good thinking, April, on the ball. And here she's included a special note for the winner of the giveaway. I love you. April, I love you. That is just, that's so sweet. 
I've never had anybody do that before, so that's, that's wonderful. Okay, here's something for everybody. I'm going to put a link to her store, The Steady Hand, in the description box below. And use the code SHEEPISHLY when you're checking out for a 20% off discount. And that's going to go until August 31st, 2017. So all Sheepishly Sharon viewers can use this discount right now. You don't have to wait for the giveaway. 20% off and the code is SHEEPISHLY. How exciting is that? <laughs> Thank you so much, April. Now you may be wondering why I have a plain black background right here, and that's because it's covering up all my sewing mess. You want to see it? There it is. So I have finished my Disney skirts. This is the one with Mickey and Pluto and Donald and Goofy, and looks like they're taking pictures of one another. And then this one, I loved this one. And the reason I like it so much, it's Dory and Nemo and some jellyfish. And the reason I like this one so much is because it's more subtle. It's like you don't realize it's a Disney skirt until you lo really look at it. And then you do see the characters right there. So um, I love it. But you might be saying to yourself, you know, why is that middle-aged woman making herself Disney skirts? Well, it's perfect for the parks, perfect for our cruise that we're going to take. It's a little bit more age-appropriate, I think, than running around in a t-shirt. <laughs> I am, as I age, you know, you start to see this, these neck wrinkles and all that, and I don't look as good in t-shirts as I used to. So let's step it up a little bit and be, uh, turn it into skirts. And I had somebody recently say, would you show us how you do your skirts? I, I can. I showed you the pattern, and I can give you a quick overview of how I do it without, you know, a full-blown tutorial. Because I've got two more skirts cut out over here of some more um, traditional fabric, not, not, you know, character fabric. <laughs> so I can. I'll take pictures as I go along the way and just show you what I do. Because I, while I pretty much follow the pattern, I told you I, I eliminate the waistband. I have a certain way of doing my zippers that I find easiest. But you know, putting in zippers, there's lots of different methods. It's very similar to knitting socks. Everybody has a different method or a different heel or whatever, but in the end, you still come out with a sock, right? Well, zippers are the same way in sewing. So I'll show you the way I do my zippers. And um, yeah, I'll just make note as I, as I go through those next skirts. I had no idea that all you people out there liked sewing as much as you do. <laughs> so I, I tend to go through phases with my sewing, and the sewing bug has really bit hard. Sewing for me is, I'm not really the most talented sewer in the world. Sewist in the world. I can do really well a few things, and then that's just about it. And I really struggle to do the other thing, especially the fitting, because I am special relationship and math challenged. And fitting, you have to have an eye for those things. But I'm, I keep trying. And right now, what you see over here that I'm working on was, is a muslin of this dress. I showed it to you last week, and I'm thinking about using the Jungle Book fabric for this dress. So I wanted to make a muslin, which is named such because muslin is a cheap fabric, and oftentimes people will make a mock-up of the project just to get fitting right and all that sort of thing. So I had this fabric. It's, it's actually from some old curtains I had ages ago. It's this very ugly polyester. I have no intention of ever wearing this, but this was where I'll make any changes or alterations and, and actually get the pattern like I like it. Or I will find out if I don't like this pattern. I may put it on and say, oh my heavens, this is very unflattering for me. Because I generally don't like to show my arms a whole lot. And this is a sleeveless pattern. So I don't 
don't know. I just figured I'll just whip it up really quick. I won't do any finishing touches. I won't do it. Now I'm just going to whip, whip it up so that I can see how it fits, how it, if I can make alterations, sizes, if I need to make alterations, things like that. So the instructions for this yoke are kind of tricky. I was thinking it's, it was going to be pretty straightforward, but it's not. Um, and I'm not sure if I can do it well enough to suit me. I don't like to wear homemade clothes where somebody goes, oh, did you make that? So if it screams happy hands at home, as Tim, Tim Gunn says, you know, Project Runway, Tim Gunn, I don't want happy hands at home clothes, so. Today's treasure chest is full of free books for everyone by way of Amazon. Now let's just type that in the search bar. Free Kindle books. Look there. Now it's worth noting that I'm an Amazon Prime customer, so if you're not, you may see a different selection. I don't know. And it's also worth noting that I'm talking only about digital books. But you don't need a Kindle device to read them. Amazon provides free apps for every mobile device as well as computers. Now, of course, you can click that to see more categories down here. Or you can just type right up here. Let's see what comes up when we type the word knitting. Look, how to knit an infinity scarf. Line brands patterns. Now some of this stuff you can easily find on the internet, so it's not that impressive that it's free. But here's an old book, look, from 1850. Wouldn't that be neat? Fancy work from 1850. Um, exercises in knitting. I don't know what that is. Scarves. Look, easy knitted bears. How cute. Knitting in the round, 10 sock patterns. You get the gist. You can search to see if there's anything here that floats your boat. But what reminded me of this was I was looking for a book. This one. It was recommended by a YouTube video, and when I pulled it up, it was free on a Kindle. Now it's telling me it's $11.99. But I happened to do a screenshot, so let me show you. See? It was free the day that I was looking it up, so lucky me. But my point is check here and check often to see what free books Amazon may be offering that you'd be interested in. And it's worth noting that sometimes they're offering audiobooks along with them as well for free. It is absolutely gorgeous outside, so let's sit out here and answer some questions. Okay, the first question comes from God Rocks 2107 and she says, Hi Margaret, question, what's your favorite brand of hook to use? Susan Bates, hands down, Susan Bates. I will use the kind with the handle if nothing else is available, but I really prefer the plain Susan Bates without the handle, and I like both that Luxite, the white plastic kind, as well as the metal. Okay, so this comes from Cottage Keeper, which is a cute name, by the way, who wants to know, let's see, I'm a beginner in crochet and knit. I could really use some help in reading patterns. Now, there are several tutorials on pattern reading uh, on YouTube, you probably would learn more by looking at websites and learning what the symbols mean and the abbreviations mean that uh, are used in these patterns that, as I've said on numerous occasions, look like algebra to me. Something that I think is even more helpful is if you can find a tutorial for a project that leads you through it as you follow the pattern. Now when I do tutorials, I'm not a big tutorial baker, but when I do, I really make a point to do that because I think that is sort of training, <laughs> so to speak. As you're working, you know exactly what to do. Another thing that I found very helpful is if I break a pattern row into usable parts. And you'll see me do that a lot on my tutorials as well. For example, you may have to do three 
different specific things in a pattern row, one pattern row. Well, if you break that up either with colored pencils or sometimes copy and paste it and, and just hit the return button on every one of the steps uh, to put a line between there, just break it down. So you know the old expression of how do you eat an elephant? one bite at a time. That applies to any big project that you have looming in front of you. Break it into small usable parts and when you get to a pattern even as simple as one row, break it into usable parts. Now this next one comes from Ambi Crafts Reads who is a longtime subscriber and she is recalling a time when I asked viewers to send video clips to come visit on my channel. and. She says she wants to do it again because she didn't get a chance to do it last time and she enjoyed seeing everybody else. I have been thinking about this, Amber. Her real name's Amber. I like to call her Amby though. I've been thinking about this. That it didn't, it was difficult last time. Um, I had people actually send me the clips. I want to do something like that, but with a specific topic. And I don't want you to send me the clips. You're going to have to tag me on social media. We'll talk more about that in the future. And by future, I mean I'll announce something next week. This will be in conjunction with the giveaway I've been mentioning. Now this next one comes from JC Bledsoe. It's not actually a question, it's just a, a comment, but she says, I've been making Bible bookmarks for the girls in my Bible study from the very fine yarns. And so I went and got my Bible because I want to talk about that. I have a Bible bookmark, a crocheted Bible bookmark that I got so many years ago and it's made of that thin cotton yarn and I don't know where it came from. I don't know who gave this to me but I have had it for absolute years. Usually when a friend gives me a bookmark I write their name on it and I date it if they didn't. And I couldn't do that with this. And I knew, I, I mean, I should have written it actually in my Bible somewhere so that I could remember. But um, I didn't do it. And I'm feeling really bad. But I hang on to it. So these types of things what, are what JC is making. If you can see how thin the yarn is, the cotton yarn. Um, so there you go. And in this book right here, there happens to be a pattern for a crocheted bookmark. Interesting, huh? Actually, this pattern is for a tatted cross bookmark. And tatting is different, so I don't know how to do tatting. And while I've got this out, I keep things in my Bible that I really find inspirational, that I want to remember, like um, fear false evidence appearing real and you may have heard that before but that is so true so often we are afraid to do something and this could be something big or it could be something simple as uh, trying thin crochet thread for example if you've never done it before and what we something will hold us back and it's usually something we've created in our heads you know it's false evidence appearing real we we think this is going to happen. And then when we jump in and try something, we realize, oh, that wasn't, what were we afraid of? You know, it's what? We don't get it. But that's a little reminder for me. And another thing I want to remind myself of is when Thomas was so little and sweet, <laughs> that was taken on the day of Tyler's high school graduation. And here he is waiting patiently to leave the house. <laughs> now this next one comes from Stephanie Chizinski. Shazinski, and she says, hi Margaret, I have a question for you. My son was recently diagnosed with autism. He's three. Good, the earlier your diagnosis, the better off you are. In a video a while back, you talked about weighted blankets. I was wondering what your thoughts were to weighted amigurumi animals. I was thinking of crocheting him one, but not really sure how to go about it. Any thoughts would be much appreciated. All right. I went, it, this was last spring, actually, if you want to look back at some of those. It was a topic that kept coming up. We were talking about any sensory type act, uh, um, item, like a twiddle muff, for example, and that morphed into lap blankets that were like twiddle muffs. You know, it had little 
textures and buttons and uh, Velcro or zippers, and that's good for not only, it's good for anyone with sensory disorder of some type. And that could be a child with autism or it could be an older person in a nursing home and more in between that. But anyway, uh, we, we talked a lot about this back last spring. My thoughts on crocheted amigurumi, the deal is this, you, the weights that you fill it with, you can either buy these little plastic pellets, but they are tiny. Or you could use uh, aquarium gravel, which is a much cheaper alternative and does the exact same thing. You could even go collect gravel outside if you wanted to and wash it really well. But the deal is this, people who benefit from these things are fiddlers. And so they will feel the weights in there. They like to feel the weights. They'll twist them and through the fabric, that sort of thing. So any type of knit or crochet, any type of yarn work, you're going to have to make sure that you enclose those in a solid fabric. You know, you have to have a little bag of it because you don't want it to come out because then it could be a choking hazard. Not to mention your project would be ruined and then it'd break your vacuum when you go to vacuum it up. But anyway, I definitely think that a weighted amigurumi animal would be beneficial. Now, of course, it depends upon the individual. For example, not everybody likes the weighted blankets. Not everybody likes the whittly things or whatever. So it's, it's kind of like a toss-up. You have to just try it. But Thomas has a weighted blanket that Louise made for him, and he loves it. It was a huge success. So I don't know. But in summation, my thoughts on a weighted amigurumi would be excellent idea, but you have to make sure that you encase those weights in some form or fashion. Okay, T. Sharp, that's Terry. How about tips on washing and blocking acrylic projects that you do for charity? She, she has two questions. Stop right there. Yeah, I, well, I already showed you what I did. It's in an older video. I can put a link in the description box below on what I do. And essentially, is I just basically wash and dry them because I don't find that soaking in hair conditioner and all that stuff actually works for acrylic. It doesn't for me. Now, you can write in the comment section, oh, it does for me, it does for me. I, it didn't for me and the reason I think is because acrylic is a form of plastic so it can't really absorb the the conditioner as say a natural fiber would what I have found with with acrylic is the agitation of the washing process and the drying process is what softens the acrylic but I'll link you to that video I'll show you how I then do this warm blocking when I take it out of the dryer and it actually does the trick. Now Louise, the same person who made the weighted blanket for Thomas, tells me that you can steam acrylic and it will hold its shape better. I personally have not done that so I can't speak to my success on that because I haven't given it a go. But that apparently is how you're supposed to properly block acrylic. There's my neighbor. I wonder if she thinks I'm weird sitting outside with the camera. Okay, the second part to Terry's question was, do you package and label them with the size? And I did not, based on where I used to take my stuff, because I didn't want them to. So I think it depends upon where you're taking them. The place where I took them used to put them all out on a table. And then people could come in and choose the one that they wanted. And remember that people have different head sizes so for example my horseback riding teacher was a full-grown adult but she had a child size head and this could be considered offensive to some people remember you're dealing with a lot of different people when you are dealing in the world of poverty and um, it's best sometimes just to let them choose what appeals to them so that's what the charity where I took my stuff wanted you to do. But I know that Erin um, is collecting for a hospital and they like the idea that they are packaged and sized and all that kind of thing. So, you know, I, I think it just depends. But you know, that's true of any charity. You need to find out what they want. You need to find out the sizes they want, the colors they want. They may be inundated with baby girl stuff and they may need something else. So whoever you're choosing to donate to, you might want to just give them a call and say, what what do you need the most? All right, now here's a good question, and this comes from Catherine Brulette. 
And she says, is it okay to mix and match different types of yarn when crocheting, such as merino and acrylic, or is that a big no-no? <laughs> well, remember, she's directing this question to me, so this is going to be my answer. And my answer is, I just don't think there's any no-nos in the world of creative endeavors, in art, in anything like that. However, you have to keep in mind that different types of yarn require different types of care. So you care for the finished project exactly as you would the most delicate of the yarns you put together. Does that make sense? So if you, if you have a merino wool, you're going to have to hand wash that item to protect the wool even though you may have, say, an acrylic trim on it or something like that. Personally, me, I, I don't like to mix. I like to keep same types of fibers together just because I, I just want it to feel all the same. And generally speaking, you've got a cost factor. The quality of the merino is generally nicer than, you know, an acrylic quality. But back to my original statement, you know, if, if you're creating it, you decide what you want to do. Just make sure you know how to care for it. Tiffany Blair has a very important question here. She says, something I consistently struggle with is choosing a color scheme for my projects. I have a hard time matching multiple colors that don't clash. And I wonder if you could do a video or even a segment on how to select colors that go well together. I struggle with this too. Now, when this gives me the most difficulty is when I am trying to work with what I already have at home. So if I'm trying to make a hat with stripes and I'm looking only at what I have at home, that's when I really get stumped because I'm limited. However, if I have a project in mind, the first thing that I would do is I would go to my very favorite most inspirational color picking site called Design Seeds and it's located at design-seeds.com. I'll put the link in the description box so you don't have to remember that but let me show you how it works. Basically they take a photograph and then pull out the colors that are located within that photograph. Watch, watch this. Every day you get a new picture and this is the one from May 3rd and it's this gorgeous door. Let me back this up. So you get a photograph of the door and then they pull out every color that is in this photograph. So you can see if you like the overall feeling you get from this, these are the colors you could put together to replicate that. Of course you're not limited to you know the color of the day. You can go up here and choose by collection and then they'll, they'll give you a whole collection of photographs that you can choose from or you could even do it by color. Let, let's see what this is. Um, let's, choose, let's choose spring since we're in spring right now. And here are some of the photographs and how they pull the colors. Or you can do it by color if you want to work within a certain color family. You just come down here and you choose a color from the palette. Let's say, let's choose this lavender. And then they give you photographs with the color lavender in it. It may not be the most primary color in the picture either, which is kind of neat. Isn't that great? And then after I decide on the colors, I can go to the store and find colors that are similar and, you know, blend together based on that research. Hope that helps. But let me show you something really interesting. I was looking over here at their social media links and I saw YouTube. Hi, I'm Jessica Cole Luca, creator of Design Seeds and Well. Anyway, she's welcoming us here in this video, but as I explored the channel, she's got a different episode on a specific color and she interviews people about that color. It may be how that color is made for certain dyes or paints or something or it might be color therapy or whatever, just different topics. I don't know, isn't that neat? I'm going to have fun exploring this. This next question comes from Ms. Ashley J, 2004, and she says, I really want to learn how to crochet what hooks are for beginners. And as far as I know, there are no hooks for beginners and those for advanced, only maybe 
the cost of the hooks. If you're a beginner, you don't know if you're going to like it or not. So why would you want to spend a whole lot of money on that investment? What I suggest is going to at one of the big craft stores, not Walmart because they only carry one brand, but to go to Michael's or Joanne and choose one boy hook and one Susan Bates hook and try it with both of them. And the reason why I tell you those two, because those are the two basic categories of crochet hooks. There are millions of different brands, but I'm going to link below a video I did a while back when I discovered the details of the different types of hooks. And that would kind of let you see that there's basically two main categories of hooks that everyone is going to fall into. However, the one thing I would caution you against is buying the really cheap boy set of plastic hooks. I bought these to donate to a charity and I couldn't do it because I thought the quality was so poor. Will it get the job done? Yes, it will. <clears throat> but it's very, very, well, don't look at this one, it's very, very flexible. And I think if you're a tight crocheter that you would be very frustrated with these. Not to mention the fact that the plastic is kind of cheap and it creates a lot of drag. Drag is when the yarn doesn't move as smoothly over. That's not the right word. It doesn't move as quickly. It's not as slick. So um, don't confuse that, however, with the Susan Bates Luxite um, that you'll find. They're always white. They don't come in different colors. This is flexible too, but not in the same way. And I don't know how to describe that. You're going to have to hold it in your hand to feel the difference. I can bend even this thick part of the cheap boy plastic one, but I cannot bend this very well at all down here. This is much faster too. It's a slicker plastic. It's called Luxite. It's a different type of plastic. So I wouldn't hesitate to buy the plastic in Susan Bates, but I would not buy the plastic in Boy. That's just my opinion. However, I think both the Susan Bates and the Boy plat uh, metal ones are great. So choose metal, I think, to start with, even though this is cheaper and you might say, oh, I'm just testing, I'm just you know, wanting to see. You don't want to create undue frustration. Two heads are better than one, so if you have something that you could add to this question or any of the other questions for that matter, don't forget to comment below. This comes from Emma's Weight Loss Journey, and I'm guessing, Emma, you have a YouTube channel. I need to check that out. Some of you may know I have a certification in lifestyle and weight management. That would interest me. So good job, Emma. Go for it. But back to her question, she said, I was wondering who are some of your favorite designers? Why you like them? What projects have you done from them? So I really had to think about this a lot. But one of my favorite crochet designers is Repeat Crafter Me. Her real name is Sarah, but she does as far as I know, only free patterns, wonderful, creative, new, fresh designs. And I like them a lot. So I'm going to link her blog down below, her website down below, and um, all of her things you can find on Ravelry as well. Uh, you'll see a lot of my character hats and stuff that have come from her. But I really love Sarah's work as far as crochet goes. Another crochet designer that I like is Snappy Tots. I have talked about them before. Uh, if you've ever seen my um, elf hats that I've crocheted around Christmas time, that came from her sweater friends pattern. Also a little bear and a penguin and I don't know, just really cute. So I think, I think she's just a fun designer. So look for Snappy Tots too. I'll put a link in the description box below to these. And then for knitting, I I love Susan B. Anderson. She also has a podcast and that she just does occasionally. She's not a real regular, you know, once a week type person. She's extremely talented and she has a variety, a wide variety of designs. Have I done a lot of her designs? No. <laughs> I'm kind of uh, false evidence appearing real. 
I am a little afraid because I feel like they're kind of advanced. Not everything that she has. I'm kind of I'm looking at some of them right here. She's got an apple washcloth, for example. That's not too complicated. I could do that. But she also does um, adorable hats and shawls and different things like that. But I think she's really, really talented. So that's another one of my favorites. And also with knitting, I'm kind of partial to Martina Bem. You've heard of the Hitchhiker Shawl. It's almost like a rite of passage for every knitter to try the Hitchhiker Shawl. That was the first one that I have done of hers. It was actually my first uh, project that I knit that I was so proud of, <laughs> that I was really enjoying, I mean, that, and wanted to wear. But she has a whole series of shawls in that Hitchhiker it's like a, it's part of a collection from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, if you're familiar with that, <laughs> if you've ever read it or heard the radio show, or is it a movie? I don't even know if it's a movie. It's pretty, it's really funny and entertaining. I don't know, but she's just an extremely talented designer. So I'll link these people down below. I don't know if you've noticed, but I've been trying really hard to get a video up every week. <laughs> I was very lax during the busy times, and I really like doing it because I love the interaction with you guys in the comment section below. So um, hopefully I can keep on track with that. That's all I got for this week. Talk soon. Bye.